Days. So more now on the £1 million bonus awarded to RBS Chief Executive Stephen Hester. Is he worth it? Well, to discuss it, we're joined by Tom Clocherty from the free market think tank, the Adam Smith Institute. Also by Philip Inman, the Guardian's economics correspondent. They're both in central London. Good afternoon to you both, gentlemen. Uh, do you think, Tom, he is worth it? It's a very difficult question for me to answer. I think it's, in fact, a difficult question for any one person to answer. You really need a, a sort of degree of omniscience to work out the answers to these questions. Now, I think what I will say, and I have to say this up front, RBS shouldn't exist in its current form. It shouldn't have been bailed out. I think bailing out was both unnecessary and has proved to be a disaster. But, you know, we are where we are. And I think the crucial thing now is that the, uh, that the government represents the taxpayers and represents their economic interests rather than using RBS as a political football. You know, we're, we're, we own lots of these shares. We're on the line for billions of pounds worth of liabilities. If you kick this bank around like a political football, I think we're going to lose out in the long run. Philip, I'll ask you to comment on that. Do you, do you think that RBS uh, is potentially being used as a political football? We've heard from the Chancellor George Osborne saying actually these things were signed and sealed uh, under the previous administration. Well, I think neither the last government nor this one really decided to tackle the whole city question of pay. You know, we've been blackmailed by these people to say that, you know, we're the only people who can do the job and you've got to pay us millions and millions in order to do it. And they never really kind of addressed that question when they set up RBS as a nationalised, effectively nationalised bank. And they haven't done it now. So really, it has to be a political football because we have to address it at some point. We should have addressed it before. But now we should really be saying to these people, look, you can't have bonuses when the thing is uh, effectively bust. You know, we have to run it as a normal, almost civil service operation. And I think that, you know, he's slimming down the bank, he's sacking people, you know, he's, uh, he's keeping wages frozen. You know, really, how does he justify taking a million pound bonus in that scenario? You use the word uh, blackmail there, Philip. I'll put that to Tom. We often hear that argument, don't we? Not just in the case of, of bonuses, but in terms of salaries as well, that these top business people will leave the country. They, the businesses here in London will be worse off without them. Um, and Philip says that is blackmail. Well, it's all very well appealing to someone's public service ethos, but if that means a bank which is making a perpetual loss, if it means billions of pounds of taxpayers' money going down the toilet, I don't really think it's public service at all. Now, you call it blackmail. I think it's probably how the market works. Now, look, there are obvious ways that the market imposes discipline on companies, discipline on executives. It's if they fail, they go bust. We haven't allowed that to happen in the case of the banks. We're stuck with RBS. I don't think we should be just throwing away taxpayers' money. And, you know, say run it like a civil service department. Well, what civil service department makes money? What civil service department is going to boost its share price so that taxpayers can get their money back? I really can't think of one. I just don't think this is the right way to think about it. It's right, in my opinion, that the government has a say on Hester's pay. They are, after all, on the taxpayers' behalf, a major shareholder in RBS. And I think one of the crucial things to make capitalism work better is to make sure that the shareholders, the owners of the company, have more control over the executives. That's all fine, but it has to be in the economic interest of the shareholders, not in the political interest of the politicians. And if we go down that road, I'm afraid it's going to be very costly. It'll do nothing for our economy and it won't do anything for the deficit either. I mean, Philip, isn't there an argument in that? It, it is more of an incentive for Stephen Hester, for the board as well, to increase the share price, the bonus is deferred for a couple of years. Therefore, it is in the long-term interest of the taxpayer as well to see that he stays and that he improves the business. Well, one of the things that Tom said there was that there is a functioning market in chief executives and top executives. And it really doesn't seem like there is. You know, the, you've got Oxford and Cambridge churning out tons of people every year, yet none of them seem to be capable of running British companies. You know, what, what is wrong out there that we can't recruit people to, uh, to these senior positions? I, I suspect there's somebody who could take over Stephen Hester's job. Uh, he's got rid of an awful lot of investment bankers, so has every other bank in the city. You know, why can't we be grooming these people for top positions? You know, it is blackmail. They all say that they're the only people who can rescue a bank uh, Tom says that, you know, well, it'll cost us more than a million if we let someone else run it. I just don't believe that. 
the, the point about it is, Tom, he, his salary is £1.2 million. Pounds. Most people can't even get their heads around someone earning a salary of that size. Why have the bonus as well? A bonus suggests something exceptional is being done. It is for a reward for doing something exceptional. That, that meaning of the word has been lost over the years, has it not? Uh, there's a fair case to be made there, but I think actually when we talk about bonuses, it, it, it kind of hides the truth actually of the way the financial industry tends to operate. Now, financial companies, banks, investment banks and so on are extremely dependent on cash flow. They're extremely volatile. They're prone to swings and roundabouts in the market. That's why they try and keep their fixed costs low. The basic salary will typically be much lower uh, than you would otherwise expect. And they pay a lot of their salary. A lot of people's contractual pay is really based on performance, is based on a bonus. So it's not so much something for exceptionally high performance as a way of banks managing their payroll, managing their costs in a particularly volatile market. Now, you could just ban the bonuses and say everybody has to have a stated salary up front. I think the effect of that would probably be that salaries would go much higher to begin with because they're competing obviously with other kinds of industries. And then when a bank ran into trouble, it would be far more difficult for them to deal with their cash flow, to deal with their fixed overheads, and they'd be more likely then to go bust. I don't really think we want that. The government shouldn't be getting involved in these questions of pay unless, yes, they're a shareholder, but then they should only get involved in a way that protects shareholders' economic interests, not political interests. Well, it, it is an economic interest, is it not, Philip Inman? I mean, the Chancellor was talking about the alternatives being worse, the alternatives to, to agreeing to this bonus, uh, the alternatives being that the, the taxpayer, the government, essentially has to take over the whole running of the bank. Well, what have you got? You've got a, a board of RBS that says, well, reportedly anyway, that they might walk out if uh, Hester doesn't get his bonus. And Hester obviously might walk out if he doesn't get his bonus. Um, do I care? I don't think I do, really. I think I could replace them all. Uh, I'm not running this bank to make uh, lots and lots of money. I totally dispute Tom's view that this is a, a volatile business where you have to pay bonuses to make up in uh, whatever it is, good times for bad. These are banks that for 15 years before the crash make consistently higher and higher profits just by lending more and more money to people who couldn't pay it back. Then the crash comes and they still want their money. They still want bonuses. They still want ever more. They're, you know, it's a bottomless pit of need as far as Citibank is concerned. And I think the government needs to address it, not just on RBS pay, but more broadly than that. They need to look across the whole piece. And the things that, uh, that uh, Vince Cable came out with the other day where he says, oh, shareholders should take more action are not going to achieve anything. Interesting to hear both your thoughts. Guardian's economics correspondent Philip Inman, Tom Cloquety from the Adam Smith Institute. Thank you, gentlemen. The owners of the capsized cruise ship, the Costa Concordia, have agreed